Hello, Mammalogy. I uh, hope you guys are all doing well. Um, welcome to our lecture for Tuesday the 14th. A um, few announcements before we get started. Uh, don't forget the hypothesis discussions. Um, those are going to be happening every Thursday this week. There's one on the domestication of dogs and next week there's a conservation paper. I believe it's on lions. Um, also do uh, Tuesday the 14th is your dichotomous key. Um, let me know if you have any questions about that. Um, and then coming up next week, we have our mammal life history presentations. Those are due Monday um, the 20th at midnight. Um, and then the paper itself is due the following Friday. So for those presentations, just make sure you email me the YouTube link for your presentations. Okay, <clears throat> so we're going to continue on with our, our topic for the day, which is domestication, which I think is a, a really interesting topic. And, um, you know, mammals are one of the most commonly domesticated animals. Um, we do have some domesticated birds, but the majority of animals that we've domesticated have been mammals. So um, it's very interesting to, to look at the domestication process. Um, so what do we mean by domestication? So domestication, um, is actually, you could consider it, if you go to community ecology, you could consider it a mutualistic relationship between a human and another animal. So we benefit from the animals and the animals in turn benefit from us. And you may look at an animal that say we eat and think about how, are, how is that animal benefiting from humans, but uh, really we are providing food and shelter for those animals until we eat them and we are increasing their reproductive capacity. So we actually do provide an evolutionary benefit to these animals and they in turn provide an evolutionary benefit to us. So that does classify as a mutualistic relationship. Um, another, other ways you can think of domestication is um, through like the control and the benefits to humans. So usually a domesticated animal is controlled by humans. So the breeding is controlled. Um, we do provide food for these animals, either through direct feeding or through um, moving them to places where um, food is available. And generally, we control the movement of domesticated animals. So you don't just allow domesticated animals to run around willy-nilly. There's usually some control over where they get to go, right? Um, and then, of course, there are benefits of those animals to the humans. So many domesticated animals were domesticated for food purposes. Um, but some animals provide protection, um, can, they can provide transportation, um, and in more modern times, animals have been domesticated for companionship as well. Um, so there's, there's a certain number of traits that are um, usually found in animals that have become domesticated. And, and these are traits that um, allow for these animals to become domesticated animals, all right? Um, so these animals have to be adaptable to a certain extent. There are some animals that are very, very difficult to keep in captivity simply because they, uh, they are not adaptable enough to um, deal with a captive environment. So for example, they might have a very specialized diet that um, is the only thing that they can survive on. And if that is the case, then um, you know, keeping them in captivity can be very, very difficult. So generally, um, domesticated animals are adaptable in what they can eat. They are uh, adaptable in, in where they can live. They don't tend to have very um, complicated behaviors that are difficult for them to maintain in captivity. Um, usually domesticated um, animals are social. Um, so they're comfortable living in groups. This makes it easier for them to be confined within areas and live in groups. Um, so that, that's a very um, useful thing. It, animals that are solitary are usually, are more rarely domesticated because um, solitary animals can't be kept together um, in a captive situation. Um, they also have to be uh, easily bred. If they've got elaborate mating rituals that can't be replicated easily in captivity, then, uh, and so they don't breed easily in captivity, then they're not going to make a good candidate for a domesticated animal. For example, pandas ha are extremely difficult to breed. Um, in fact, uh, there were two pa pandas in China that they've, they've been trying to get to mate for 10 years, and they finally mated like 
last week or the week before, probably partially because there's nobody at the zoo right now because of the pandemic. Um, and so it was actually calm enough that these two pandas finally made it. So pandas would be a lousy choice for um, domestication, whereas many of dom domesticated animals will breed very, very easily regardless of the situation. Um, and then many of them also will flee in herds. Um, this makes them easy to keep together in a group um, and direct their movement in a way that is beneficial. So down here at the bottom, we have um, the, the typical flocking sheep that are easy to move about the pastures with the aid of another domesticated animal, the dog, um, because they tend to stay grouped up um, as they move. All right, so those are some traits that make it more easy for animals to be domesticated. So typically what happens in the processes of domestication is you have some sort of contact between the humans and some sort of wild species. Um, generally, the next step is to confine the wild species for easy access. So that's either through fencing or through use of a herding an uh, animal like a dog um, and that type of thing. The next step is reproduction within confinement and then um, what generally tends to happen is that humans start to artificially select those domesticated animals for favorable traits. So, um, you know, once those animals are breeding in confinement, you might select, say, if you're looking at um, a herd animal that has like a cow, that you would have one bull and a whole bunch of female cows, um, you might select the most even tempered bull, not the one that wants to gore you all the time. Like if you have two bulls and one is always trying to gore you and the other one isn't, you're probably going to eat the one that's been trying to gore you and keep the one that's not trying to gore you. And so that is putting selective pressure of more docile behavior um, on that population of cows. And then the final thing that tends to happen um, in domestication is that oftentimes the wild ancestor is actually removed from the wild, like the wild ancestor goes extinct. Um, and the reason that that often happens is because a lot of times the wild ancestor is using the same resources as the domesticated animal. And so um, if there are other animals that are competing for the resources that your domesticated animals are trying to utilize, humans have a, a habit of, of killing those competitors to improve the situation for their domesticated animals. So many of the ancestors of um, these domesticated animals have gone extinct. All right, so uh, humans have been domesticating mammals for quite some time. Um, the earliest evidence of a domesticated mammal is actually dogs. Um, and on this uh, little timeline here, the dog is actually not accurately placed. There's, there's actually evidence that dogs may have been domesticated as much as 33,000 years ago. So a very long time ago. Um, most of the domestication, however, has occurred in about the last 10,000 years, plus or minus. All right, so let's start by talking about dogs. Um, dogs are the first domesticated animal. Dogs have been living with humans for a very, very long time. And dogs are kind of interesting because they are um, a bit different from a lot of the other uh, domesticated animals. Although there are some cultures that do consume dogs, dogs were generally not kept as a food animal. Um, dogs are descended from a wolf um, and there is good evidence that dogs were actually domesticated independently in several different locations. So there's evidence that they were domesticated in Europe, in Asia, and in North America. Um, so clearly this relationship between dogs and wolves was something that was beneficial to early humans. Um, and then of course, we put tremendous selective pressure on dogs. So most, dog, most domesticated dogs now do not look much like a wolf because they have been selectively bred for either uh, appearance or particular behaviors. Um, so many of our dogs are um, dogs that have jobs. So for example, dogs that help us um, herd our other domesticated animals. So there's a lot of herding dogs. There's a lot of hunting dogs that have been bred to help us capture uh, food. Um, and um, there's also a lot of dogs that have been bred purely for companionship as well. Um, so in terms of how dogs became domesticated, there's kind of two hypotheses. Uh, one is that humans um, 
saw some abandoned pups and took them in um, and reared them uh, in, with humans and brought them into captivity that way. But actually what might be more likely is that dogs are an example of what we would call self-domestication. So humans, um, when we hunt and we kill things, we often will have garbage piles near our places where we live and we'll throw the remains of our food, old bones, um, whatever you know, stuff out into these garbage piles. Um, and that became a source of food for scavenging dogs. Um, and so it may have been that the, um, the dogs that were less fearful of hu humans could take more advantage of those um, garbage piles and um, it was a, an advantage. So they, they gradually became less and less fearful of humans because they were relying on those garbage piles. And then at that point, maybe there was um, somebody picked up some puppies or who knows exactly how they started to live with us instead of just living off of humans. Um, so there's actually pretty strong evidence that um, having dogs uh, is something that's been evolutionary advent evolutionarily advantageous for humans. Um, so for example, um, early relationships with dogs may have been um, uh, as a, a warning or as a guard a guard animal. So if a potential predator was sneaking into uh, a human settlement while humans were sleeping, the dogs would bark and alert the humans. And so there's actually a benefit of having these dogs. Since then, we've also bred dogs to do a lot of other things, but um, that there's actually pretty good evidence that humans have been selected to think dogs are cute and to enjoy being around dogs. Um, also, dogs have been selected to communicate with humans. So dogs are uh, much better at understanding human communication um, innately than wolves are. So you can take a, a, a domesticated puppy and they will cue on to human signals um, even if they've never been trained. Uh, but if you take a wolf puppy, um, they, they don't cue to human signals in nearly the same way. So there's definitely been a lot of selective pressure on dogs to communicate with people. Um, this little example here at the bottom, uh, this is an example where they were looking at dogs' ability to understand human body language. And so they hid a treat in one of those two cups. And then the human in the video looked at which cup it was. And the dogs, even though there was no direct contact between the dog and the human, the dog was able to pick up on the human looking at the cup and then go to that cup to retrieve the treat. So that um, indicates that dogs are definitely cueing into those human, human body language. Um, an interesting uh, aside is that another canid has been domesticated. Um, in Siberia in the 1940s, there was a, um, a it was actually a, a fur farm, but they did an experiment where they were trying to domesticate wild foxes. And so what they started doing was selecting based on behavioral traits. So they selected foxes that were less fearful of humans, that, um, that didn't try to escape when humans approached their cages and that um, tolerated being petted. And they bred them for 20 generations, keeping the, the most docile and most um, interested in humans foxes. And after 20 generations, they found most of the foxes were eager for human attention. They actually wanted to interact with humans. But I think what's even more interesting is that there were some um, physical changes that they were not selecting for that also came along with those behavioral traits. So the foxes tended to have uh, more um, patchy coloration, um, more white patches, um, more floppy ears, uh, so less cartilage in the ears. And this suggests that, that some of these um, behaviors like do being docile are actually uh, correlated with some of the um, physical traits that we see in domesticated dogs that, uh, that are also, also desirable. Okay, moving on to some of our uh, food animals. Um, goats and sheep were domesticated about the same time, around 10,000 years ago. Um, and the evidence suggests that they were most likely domest domesticated in the Middle East, although there, it's possible that there were several locations of domestication um, throughout the world. Um, it's a little bit uh, 
unclear still how many origins of domestications of goats and sheep there were. Um, now the, uh, the wild ancestor of the domestic goat is something called a Zor goat. Um, and the wild ancestor of the domestic sheep is probably something like a mouflon. So that's what these guys are at the top here. Um, we have a Zor goat and the mouflon there. Um, these animals were domesticated primarily for food. Um, so first, first of all, probably most likely for their meat. Uh, although eventually we did start making use of their milk as well. Um, and then secondarily, um, using their wool for fiber. Um, so particularly the sheep was selected to produce an Angora pelt where the, the wool grows continuously. Um, and that makes these much longer fibers, which can be woven into or spun into thread when used to make clothing and whatnot. Um, probably originally we, um, we used their hides for clothes after they were slaughtered, but uh, eventually we did um, breed them to produce this fur that we could then, you could then uh, shear the animal over and over again and, and use the, the fur each time. Um, these are great examples of herd animals that um, move together in groups. And the, um, the original way to keep goats and sheep was not necessarily to fence them, but rather to um, use usually dogs to move them through the environment. And so uh, being a shepherd or a goat herd was a very common um, way of life uh, in early human history. And because these animals are very tightly herded animals, um, it was easy to move them to where resources were available for those things. Um, goats and sheep also show uh, neotenic traits, which means that they uh, tend to remain looking quite like babies as they grow. So uh, what you'll notice between those wild ancestors and the domesticated versions is that for one thing, the horns are much smaller. So the horns have been selected against um, and the, that the wool actually is the evidence is that that is a, a, a selection on the baby fur of those animals that then we selected them to keep that fur throughout their lives rather than losing that fur as they grew. Um, so that's uh, some of those neotenic traits that have been selected for in, in goats and sheep. <clears throat> um, cattle were probably also domesticated uh, about 10,000 years ago uh, from an animal called an auroch. Um, the auroch only went extinct in the 1600s. They were still present in, um, in Europe until the 1600s, but they were, the auroch was a much larger animal and a much more dangerous and aggressive animal. So eventually it would, they were um, killed off mostly because they were a dangerous animal to have around. Um, cattle were most likely either domesticated in North Africa or the Middle East. Again, um, Food was another major component here, particularly with the cows, um, milk. So this is the milk of cows is one of the important food items, but also the hide. So leather from cows has been really important for making clothing. And then cows were also used to um, do work. So a lot of early um, plowing of fields would have been done with an ox, which is basically a large domesticated cow. Um, and then now, however, um, cattle, in addition to uh, being domesticated for these features, we still um, use them extensively for food, particularly in um, the U.S. Uh, the U.S. is one of the largest beef consumers, milk consumers, cheese consumers in the world. Um, but there's also cultural significance. So in, in um, Spain, they still have the running of the bulls, which is very culturally significant. Uh, Texas Longhorn has cultural significance in the Southwest. And then um, in many Hindu cultures, um, the cow cows are actually considered sacred and um, they're very important to their religious practices. So cows have become really, really intertwined with, with humans. All right, the pigs. Pigs were probably domesticated about 12,000 years ago um, from a wild boar. Wild boars do still exist and actually pigs uh, quite quickly will go feral if you release them back into the wild. And um, they, they are pretty much not terribly domesticated. They, they, there's not a whole lot of changes between a wild boar and a domesticated pig. Um, pigs have a very flexible diet. They are omnivorous. They will eat pretty much anything. Um, they were originally domesticated again for food and hides, 
but also for sanitation. Um, so in many cultures, um, there they actually w made what are called pig toilets, where they would dig a hole and well, they'd have a, a latrine and you'd stand up and you you know poop down the latrine and it would roll down and the pig would eat the poop. Um, and that way you didn't have to deal with all of that human waste that was potentially disease causing. Um, so the, that was a one way of dealing with human waste back in the day. Um, I think that's about all I wanted to say about pigs. Uh, horses are actually one of the most more recently domesticated animals. Um, horses were only domesticated about 5,000 years ago. The ancestor of the, the horse is no longer with us. Um, but there are horses that are similar. Privlowski's horse is similar to the ancestor uh, of the horse. That is an endangered species. Um, it appears that horses were probably domesticated in the Ukraine, um, but they very quickly sp spread throughout the world. Uh, horses were an extremely um, world-changing domestication event because horses allowed for a much faster transportation than humans were able to do previously. So once we had the domesticated horse, instead of being able to go, you know, <clears throat> you know, probably on the order of like, you know, 10 or 12 miles a day, you could cover tens of miles a day. So it was a really huge um, advancement. And particularly once we had horse-drawn carriages and whatnot. Um, so transportation was a really important factor. And, and humans, throughout the world quickly realized the benefit of having horses. So for example, um, horses were not native to North America, um, but when Europeans arrived, the Native Americans very quickly saw the benefit of having horses and um, domestic, they, horses escaped and became feral and or were traded to, to Native Americans and very quickly became an extremely important part of their culture as well because of the benefit of having those animals. Um, of course, horses have incredible cultural significance. Um, in some cultures, people do eat horse, but in many cultures, it's considered to be taboo to eat horses. They're considered to be a companion animal. Um, a lot of laws have been uh, written uh, about horses and protecting horses. Um, some of the most severe punishments were saved for horse thieves. Um, so it's a, they've been a really, really important to, to human cultural development um, over the years. All right, um, another pair of interesting animals, the llama and the alpaca. Um, llamas and alpacas are actually two different species. Uh, they're domesticated about 7,000 years ago in South America by um, native South Americans from two animals called the gu gu guanaco, I can pronounce that word, guanaco, and the vicuña. Um, and um, these were two wild camelids that were native to the Andes, or <clears throat> are native to the Andes, they still exist. Um, and these animals were domesticated, uh, again, for their fur and also for their meat. Um, in fact, um, the fur, the vicuña is actually still, um, captured by people in um, the, the Andes in South America um, and sheared. Um, and the vicuña fur, which is the wild animal's fur, is very, very highly sought after. But llama and alpaca fur uh, makes very, very nice yarn and very cozy uh, clothing that is really important to um, those peoples of South America. Um, all right. Cats are an interesting one. Um, so cats haven't been domesticated for very long. Um, they were only domesticated about 5,000 years ago, either in uh, Egypt or the Middle East or China <clears throat> or all three. Um, they were domesticated from the African wild cat, which is pictured here, which looks pretty much like a cat. Um, and cats are interesting because they are one of the few domesticated mammals that um, are, were domesticated from a solitary animal. Um, there's also evidence that these guys may have been self-domesticated. They may have started living in close proximity to humans because of the resources that were available for humans. And the evidence is that they were, um, they were domesticated primarily for vermin control, um, which of course was very, very important because um, mice and rats 
uh, can transmit a lot of diseases and keeping populations of those mice and rats under control is very important for human health and also it keeps the mice and rats from eating your food. So having a small predatory animal that will take care of those critters for you is definitely advantageous. Now cats quickly um, uh, achieve some degree of uh, importance, particularly in Egyptian culture where they were revered. Um, there are tons of mummified cats that have been buried with Egyptian royalty. Um, so the, <clears throat> they definitely had a, um, they were considered to be sacred by those Egyptian cultures. Um, and then once we had cats in our presence and living in close proximity and they started breeding like indoors, then we had selective pressure on them to be a more social. Um, so modern cats are definitely much more social than a wild cat would have been. Um, and also uh, more uh, interested in human contact. Um, but that's part, part of the reason why cats probably are, while not impossible to train, more difficult to train uh, than dogs is because they just haven't had as long of an exposure for that human-dog uh, human or human-cat relationship to really evolve. <clears throat> so um, there's really good evidence that you know domesticating animals did benefit humans. Um, one example that I think is particularly interesting is looking at um, ability to consume lactose uh, throughout um, your lifespan. Now um, lactose is a sugar that is found in milk um, and all humans have a gene that allows us to break down and digest lactose. And uh, historically or evolutionarily, that gene would have only been on, turned on in humans um, when they were feeding upon milk. So in the first few years of their life, when they're nursing, um, and then later developmentally, that gene would turn off and you would no longer be able to digest that, that sugar. But um, a mutation arose that kept the lactase, or the enzyme that breaks down lactose, the lactase gene active um, throughout the lifespan. And as soon as that mutation arose, it very quickly spread through the human population. It clearly had um, a tremendous fitness advantage because if you were able to consume milk uh, from another animal, a cow, a sheep, a goat, um, throughout your lifespan, then that's a food source that you have continuous access to. And so in cultures where um, dairy consumption is very prevalent, <clears throat> you tend to see very high um, frequency of this mutation. Whereas in cultures where um, dairy consumption is not uh, typical, you tend to see much higher um, proportion of the population being lactose intolerant. Um, so for example, South African countries and um, South Asian countries where uh, dairy consumption was not typical, but European and North African countries, you tend to see very high rates of ability to consume lactose. All right, well, that's my lecture on domestication. Hope you all are doing well and I'll catch you later.